This week's painting tutorial is a pretty simple one that's geared toward beginners. It's one that anybody can paint. And as you can see, this one is about painting water, painting a crop section of the ocean with some small waves and ripples in it. Now I tried the best I can to keep this one as easy as possible so that anyone can paint it. You don't need to have any special skills or painting talent to complete this one but you're gonna need something that's more important than any of that, and that's patience. In this one, there's a lot of highlights and shadows that need to be painted in, and there's no quick way to do it, and there's no shortcuts. It's not like this one's gonna take you a week to paint, but it'll take a few solid hours of work. My goal and hope in this video is to show that as a painter, the most precious commodity is time. And of course, this is just my opinion, but the more time that you spend on a painting, the better that you can get it to be. Because not only are you practicing painting, but you're practicing two other things, that's patience and observation, which are way more important than any sort of natural talent or skill. And the only way that you could build up or foster these things is with time. So up on the screen now is a high resolution photo of my completed painting. So if you're gonna be painting along with me, please feel free to use this as your reference. And like always, I'll be adding the high resolution photo along with the grids up on the members page. I'll be painting this one on a quarter inch piece of MDF, which is 11 inches by 14. And because this is a simpler painting and it's smaller, I decided to use this rather than canvas. And I bought these sheets on Amazon, so I'll have a link for those down below. And like always, I applied some gesso to this. I only needed two coats here, and then I wet sanded it just to remove any texture. I drew in all my contour lines using a light 4H pencil, and I just did it freehand because this is on the simpler side. So you could do this or use a grid to get these lines in place, but if you're just starting out, there's nothing wrong with tracing it. That way you'll know that all those lines are in the correct places so you have some confidence to move forward. The color in my airbrush is Payne's Gray, which is kind of like a very dark, desaturated blue. And like always, I reduced it about 10 to 15% with some distilled water. That way it's going to flow through the airbrush a little bit easier. And I'm spraying here right around 20 PSI. And you don't have to use Payne's Gray for this. Any type of blue will work. Cobalt blue would work great. It'll give you some more saturation. Just go with any blue that you have. The reason that I like Payne's Gray is just because it's a bit more desaturated. It's not that bright or vibrant. And that's usually what I like in my paintings. Now this whole painting is going to be about adding in those dark shadows and dark highlights right next to each other. That's going to give off the illusion of water. So if you take a look at my completed painting on the left, what I'm working on is this area right here. I just want to start filling in this shadow. And I'm not going to go too dark right away. Once I get that basic shape in, I'm going to move to the shadow just below it, which is going to be this large wave at the bottom of the painting, which is almost pure black. You'll notice here that I'm not using a shield for this. I'm doing all of this freehand. The reason for that is because the lower part of the painting is going to be slightly more blurred, a little bit more out of focus, and then as we move up, it's going to get sharper. When I'm painting in freehand like this, what I like to do is paint in the edges first. So I'm holding the airbrush about three, four inches away from the canvas and getting those edges in. Once those are in place, I could start spraying in the darker shadows below it. You could see here that this bottom wave, this like almost triangle shape, is really just almost pure black. So if I just keep building up layer after layer of this Payne's Gray, it'll eventually start to look almost pure black. The paint line that I'm using is Createx Illustration Colors, which means that this is a transparent paint. And even though I want this paint to be dark, I don't want to get to that right away. I want to work up by building up layers. I'm not just hosing it out, spraying it 100%. The reason that I want to start light and slowly work my way up to a darker color is just to give myself some more room for error. When the paint is on the lighter side like it is here, it's really easy to shift any of these edges or change them. But if the paint is very dark, it's very difficult to either spray an opaque color over the top and get it to fully hide it or use an eraser. So just try to go light. It's going to give yourself some more breathing room, some more room for error. So as you continue into the painting, you'll have more options to fix any mistakes. And while I'm painting in the shadows here for these waves, I'm not really too concerned with following the reference perfectly. I'm of course using it to guide me, but I'm not too concerned with getting everything exactly like the reference. This is not like a portrait where you really have to follow those basic curves and contours, because if you get them wrong on a portrait, like a jawline or the shape of the nose, it's going to look like a different person. But on a wave like this or water, you know, it really doesn't matter. You just want to try to get it close and follow those darks and lights. And so at this point, just with that same color the whole time, I got in three major shadows and I'll just keep building them up. You'll notice that as I'm spraying in this paint for the dark areas, I'm also lightly glazing it over the areas that are going to have highlights. 
like these areas right here that I'm pointing out, I just want to glaze some of this paint over the top. Now obviously this is going to darken the area and we're going to need to brighten it up later. We'll use some opaque paint for that. But what this small glaze does in these highlight areas is give us some of the mid-tones. It's going to give us some of those transitions between the bright highlights that we'll paint in later and some of the shadows that we're painting in right now. And that's one of the great things about painting with an airbrush. A lot of times it paints the mid-tones in automatically because the overspray naturally gets in those areas. So it's just not going to be like traditional paint where you actually have to mix individual mid-tones and paint them in. This is going to do it for you. As I start to move up the canvas, I want to paint in some of these areas a bit sharper so it looks like this area is more in focus than the area below it. You could of course do this freehand just by holding the airbrush closer. That'll give you some sharper, darker lines. But I want to show you a technique that I like to use with the shield. If you look at my shield here, you'll notice that I'm not holding it directly on the canvas. I'm kind of floating it like a quarter inch off the canvas. And what this ends up giving me is a sharper line, but it's not as sharp as if I hold the shield right on it and spray over it. And this isn't difficult to do, but it feels a little odd because the airspeed from the airbrush is just adding some turbulence, so you'll feel the shield kind of shaking. And what I'm looking for is a line that looks like this. It's sharp, but it's not razor sharp. It doesn't look like I used a stencil for it, but it's clearly sharper than what you'd get if you just painted it in freehand. And again, you could do all of this freehand. You don't need any sort of shields for this. Just hold the airbrush closer to get yourself some sharper lines. Once I get a line or an edge of a wave painted in, then I'll just start painting in below it, painting in the rest freehand, filling in that area, getting it dark. And I want to continue this process as I work my way up, but I'm not jumping around. I'm just working from one wave to the next. So from here, I'm going to move up to this wave on the left side of the painting. I'll paint this one in freehand just to show the difference between this and a shield. And what I'm doing here is I'm holding the airbrush a lot closer to the surface, about two inches at most. And I'm trying to spray a bit more paint to get that edge in sharper. And you can see with this that you can get a line painted in very sharp just by painting it in freehand, but you'll never get it as sharp as a shield or a mask. And then just like before, once that edge is in, I spray the rest in freehand, that area below it, just a few layers of paint to get it dark. And of course, for any of those areas that are going to be brighter and highlight, I still want to make sure that I spray some of this paint over the top for now, just to get some of that blue in for the mid-tones. Before I go any further, I want to start adding in some of these highlights. So the color in my airbrush right now is opaque white with a very small amount of orange. I don't measure it or anything like that, but it's something like 20 drops of white to one to two drops of orange, just a small, small amount. The purpose of adding the orange into the white is just to mitigate some of that blue shift. It's not going to eliminate it when you're spraying a white opaque paint over a darker paint. You're always going to get a small amount of blue shift. But for this painting, it's no big deal because the painting is blue anyway. So if you'd like, you could just use white directly from the bottle. That'll work just fine. I just like to add a little bit of orange into it. Now I'm going to use this color to start spraying into those highlight areas and just like the dark color, I want to build this up slowly. I'm using Createx Illustration colors here and one thing that I noticed about these is that since they're erasable, they're not a very strong paint. And what happens is that layers tend to kind of bleed into the layers underneath. If you're using a stronger paint like Wicked Colors or Golden High Flow Acrylics, you're not going to have to worry about this. The colors really don't tend to bleed. But with the illustration line, they do. And there's a few ways to get around this. There are mediums that you could add to it, you know, something like matte medium, which is going to give you a much stronger binder and it will dry and cure a lot harder. And another popular technique is to use something like a clear coat in between layers, something like spraying a thin layer of a matte medium, a varnish, or a clear over the top before you start adding on the next layer of white. But my favorite way to use opaques with Createx Illustration is just to build up these layers slowly, just like what I did before with the transparent dark. What I'll do is spray on some white and let it dry just for a few minutes. If any of that blue underneath starts to bleed into it, what I could do is let that dry as the midtone and then spray some more white over the top. And as long as I let each layer dry, I can come in again with the white and just keep building it up to get the opacity that I'm looking for, to get that really bright white. It's definitely a slower process, but you're going to get a lot more control because you're not just jumping to the pure white. You're working your way up to it. And the theme of this video is really about that patience needed for painting. So make sure you're taking your time and don't worry if it takes longer than you expect. As I'm using this white, you'll notice that I'm not only spraying into those highlighted areas, but I'm also spraying into some of the layers of blue like I'm doing down here on the lower left hand side of the painting. What I can do with this is just lighten up some of those areas and blend the highlight in. 
Again, this is just like a mid-tone. It's a transition between that really dark shadow and the bright highlight. And like I mentioned, the illustration line tends to bleed into the layers underneath, but for some areas like this, it's actually very helpful. What I've noticed is that when I paint this white over a lot of that blue paint in the darker shadows, I just get such a soft layer of that white in, and it just looks like a very smooth transition. And I just personally love the effect that you can get with this. It's almost like a ghosting effect where you can barely even see it, but it's just enough to kind of show that there's a wave there, or there's something going on within that shadow. I'll continue using that white paint along the right side of the painting, just spraying in between those shadows, giving those highlights, just brightening them up. And like I said, it is important to build them up slowly, but if you catch yourself spraying too much paint or an area is getting a lot lighter than you want it to be, you could switch right back over to that transparent Payne's Gray and start spraying over the top again to darken those areas up. And that's what I'm doing here. I switched back over to the Payne's Gray and I'm spraying in between, just spraying those shadows in again, darkening them. While I'm doing this, I'm also letting some of the overspray from this darker blue paint just kind of blend in that transition between the highlight and the shadow. And of course that area is called the midtone. and what's so cool about this technique is that the midtones kind of paint themselves. The overspray does all the work for you. And then once that blue is in, I'll switch right back over to the white like I'm doing here. And then I'm just going to go back and forth between these. And when you switch back and forth like this, you're just going to get so much control. If anything gets too bright, switch back over to the dark color. If something gets too dark, switch over to the white. So when you're using opaque colors like this, you'll see that it's a lot more forgiving because you don't get stuck if an area gets too dark, like if you're only using an eraser. Even though this is a small painting, I'm spraying a fair amount of paint. And I don't know if you could see just quickly in the video there, but I'm wearing a mask. And just as a reminder, it's always a good habit to have a good mask nearby just to prevent yourself from breathing in some of that overspray. As I work my way up, the shadows and the highlights of each wave are going to be smaller. This is because of linear perspective. Very simple concept that we all know, objects closer to us are going to appear bigger, farther away they're going to look smaller. And as I'm painting in the shadows for some of these smaller waves, you'll see me switching off between a shield and freehand. I'm mainly using shields in this part of the painting because this is the area that I want to be in focus. As it goes farther back, things should get a little bit blurrier. And the same thing goes for the waves closer to us in the foreground. I also want those to be a little bit blurrier. It's not going to add that much to the painting, but the goal is just to kind of give off a little bit of that lens effect. And when I have a few of those shadows in, then I'll switch back over to the white. You'll notice that I don't paint all of the blue first and then go over to the white. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to paint in all the shadows first, that's completely fine. For me, I always like to focus on a smaller part of the painting and try to render it the best I can before moving forward. That's just my approach and you could do it any way you'd like. Now this is something that I talked about in a bunch of videos already, but in order to get that illusion, to make it look like it's wet, to make it look like it's shiny, you really need to have those dark values in right next to those really bright values. It's the same thing when you're painting metal or if you're painting a specular highlight like on the eye to make something look wet. You need dark right next to light values with very little transition between them. The midtones are going to be very small. And that's exactly what I'm doing here as I work my way toward the back of the painting. I'm adding a bunch of very small thin lines of dark blue paint. And of course the shadows here are going to be smaller because these waves are farther away. But this is the part where your patience is really going to come in because it's kind of slow and it's a bit tedious. And as I'm painting these in, I'm using the reference as a guide, but there's no way that I'm following it one to one. I'm just trying to paint in a bunch of small horizontal lines. The way that I'm approaching this is just sticking with the blue to try to get as much of these in as I can. And this part is really easy. It's almost like an abstract painting. You're just painting in small horizontal lines next to each other. The illusion of water will start to come in when I switch over to the white color, which is what I'm going to do now. You'll notice that I'm starting on the bottom here. This is what I talked about before. I let those layers dry. That way I can spray some more paint over the top and just kind of build up that opacity of the white paint. And as I work my way up, all I'm doing is spraying in this white paint in between those black lines. This white paint is going to act as the highlights of the waves, and the dark lines are going to act as the shadows. And of course, when you spray in that white paint, overspray is going to get onto some of those dark shadows, so you could always go right back over them, like what I'm doing now, with that Payne's Gray to darken them back up. And that's pretty much it. It's just following that same step over and over. The only thing you're changing is as you go farther back, the waves are going to get smaller. So the highlights and shadows are both going to be smaller than they are in the front. 
Again, I want to say that this is a very simple, easy painting that anyone can do. But if you start rushing or think you can get it done in 20 minutes or a half hour, it's going to become incredibly difficult and frustrating. It's all about slowing down, working on one part, taking breaks, and coming back to it again later. This entire painting probably took me about three hours, three and a half hours at the most, and I took plenty of breaks in between. And three hours is a pretty quick painting for me, but it's very different than trying to sit down and do it all in one shot. So even if you're just starting out and you want to paint this one, I promise you could do it. It's all about taking your time and you'll be fine. And the more time that you spend on it, the better you can get the final painting to look. If I spent much more time on this, like double the amount or triple, you know, six or nine hours or so, I can get it to look a lot better than it does right now. I wanted to keep this one on the simpler side so that anyone could paint it, but I think that this one works well enough to show off the effect of water or the ocean. So if you're just starting out in painting and you want to try this one, kind of paint one of your first realistic looking paintings, just don't be intimidated with this. Give it a shot. Dive right in. That's that's a pun there. I didn't mean that. But uh, yeah, just just go for it. It's not a hard painting. It's about taking your time and just really, really learning to slow down. If you feel like you're struggling with it or that you failed the first time through, so what? It's not a big deal. It's a great excuse to start a new painting. So I do hope that this video was helpful and you picked up a thing or two. And of course, I'd like to thank the channel members for their extremely generous support. I'd like to welcome the newest channel members, Catherine, Enrique, and Jimbo. And I'd also like to welcome back NH and Daz at a very generous tier 3. Thank you all so much. So that's it for this week's video. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you back here next week.